Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. As always, I am your host, Nico Perino. It's been a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of months, I can't remember, since we last checked in with my colleagues here at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. The last time we did check in, we were talking about how busy this past summer has been for us. We saw a dramatic rise in our case submissions and visitors to our website, signaling uh, increased interest in FIRE's work. Um, I'm sorry to say that that interest in our work uh, remains, partly because the threats to free speech, due process, academic freedom, and a free press remain on campus. And I am joined today by my colleague, Robert Shibley. He's the executive director of FIRE. And my other colleague, Adam Goldstein, who is senior research counsel to the president of FIRE. That is, of course, Greg Lukianoff. Robert and Adam, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So we're going to discuss some of the most recent cases uh, that FIRE has seen, some of the most egregious cases that FIRE has seen. And I want to return to my old stomping grounds of uh, New York State. Uh, I'm now not in New York State, but I was there for a long time to talk about a case that we have at St. John's University, which I believe is what, in Queens, Adam? Uh, I believe that's right, yeah. Over in Queens uh, at St. John's University, we had a professor there, Richard Taylor, who was teaching a history class on the subject of the Columbian Exchange. Not not something I was familiar with, uh, although I was familiar with the idea that there was this process of globalization that began in the 15th century and all of that, what, what that entailed. But the Columbian Exchange is what we call that process of globalization. And in Professor Taylor's discussion of the Columbian Exchange, he talked about the good things that came along with it, uh, including increased trade, uh, new discoveries. But he also discussed some of the bad things that came along with it, including the slave trade. Uh, and during the course of his discussion, of the Columbian Exchange, he asked his students if the positives of the exchange justified the negatives. Uh, now, our listeners might anticipate some of the problems that might create uh, in the discussion in our modern age where everyone is looking uh, to be offended, some might say. Uh, but Adam, there was, uh, there was considerable backlash and, in this case, punishment of Professor Taylor, correct? There was. Uh, at the time... I should say that Taylor had two sections of this intro to history course, each with about 30 students. One student in the morning section objected and said there's no justification for slavery. And he clarified, well, I'm not asking anyone to justify slavery. Slavery can't be justified. I'm asking people to consider the effects of things like biodiversity and uh, saving people from famine. Um, this student made a complaint to the school, but more importantly, they told a student activist group, SJU Radicals, SJU for St. John's University Radicals, which then created a form letter that students could, well, not just students, anyone could put in their email and send a letter complaining about this discussion uh, topic. <laughs> well, <laughs> this discussion topic, well, I, I say that, although the discussion topic that was actually being claimed in the letter was that the, the letter claims that the professor asked them to justify slavery, which obviously was not but, what they But I mean, was. let's be clear. I mean, it is one of the negatives that he was discussing in the course, you know. So it it's, absolutely it, is. And it's not, and I, and I want to say as a former history major, uh, that it's not an unusual question to ask. I recall it being asked of me in my U.S. history classes three or four times with regard to the creation of the United States Constitution in which the founders of America uh had a compromise essentially on slavery that allowed the constitution to be ratified. Uh, you were often asked, you know, whether the compromise was worth it. Um, the idea being that, you know, if, if it was it worth it to allow slavery in order for the constitution to come into being, um, 
because I think most historians would say without that compromise, you might not have a United States of America. You might have two separate countries. Uh, and then there's also, of course, the contextual discussion that comes around these sorts of do the po positives justify the negatives. And so far as in the 15th century during the Columbian Exchange, slavery was worldwide, uh, essentially. I, you know, there were very few countries that didn't have it. Uh, so just adding a little bit of color there to how common these sorts of questions are. And, not, and, it, and these questions, of course, do not diminish uh, the serious problems and obvious problems that come along uh, with the oppression, subjugation, and enslavement of, of human beings. Yeah, I, absolutely not. And I think as a thought exercise, it's completely valid. It's also a question that we can never ultimately answer, right? It's a moving target. How we evaluate the United States today is different than how we evaluated 100 years ago. How we're going to evaluate it in 100 years, if all things going, all things being equal, we're still here in 100 years. Uh, the the point of asking the question isn't to arrive at a conclusion, but to think about all the consequences of history. Yeah, and in doing that. Um... Professor Taylor was asking his students to do what most liberal arts professors do, which is think critically about history. But that resulted in something like 300 complaints of misconduct against him. Um, many of those complaints prompted by the SJU Radicals Instagram page, asking people to write in complaining about Professor Taylor's uh, discussion topic. Now, <laughs> one of the funny things about this case, or I, I should say the sad things about these cases, is that he only had 30 students in the class. I think he had two classes, right? 30 students in each. So 300 of these complainants weren't actually in the classroom and didn't know the context. Right. At the time he was, uh, I should say, you know, after these complaints were made, eventually he was called into a meeting with a Title IX coordinator and was told that there were over 300 complaints against him, which, as you pointed out, surprised him because the math didn't exactly work. At that point, the, the coordinator explained to him there were 300 email complaints and then one in-person complaint. Now, what actually happened? So the the director of Equal Opportunity and Compliance, Keaton Wong, informed Taylor of these complaints. What happened next? Was he told what policies he was being investigated under? Was he told whether this was a serious investigation? What what happened next? Uh, he had a meeting with the with the investigator and a union rep, and was told that he was accused of violating the school's bias policy. The, the bias policy is several pages long and covers everything from uh, sexual harassment to hostile environment to outright racism. He wasn't told specifically what it was about this alleged question that would have violated that policy, he did, however, provide the investigator with a copy of this PowerPoint that he used in the presentation and his notes and, and said that this isn't the question I asked. Uh, he left the meeting and then didn't hear anything for a couple weeks. And then when he did hear things, he was told that he was found in violation of that policy, which is 2,300 words long. But he was not told what specific part of the policy he is said to have he had violated, right? And was, there, was he allowed for an appeal? Uh, he was not. The result of the investigation, as he got it, was a uh, a, a, a three-paragraph letter that told him there was an investigation, didn't say what evidence it considered, just that an investigation happened, and that as a result of the investigation, he was found to have violated the policy and didn't say how he violated the policy, and the last paragraph was devoted to telling him this was a final decision he could not appeal. Yeah, so he doesn't even know exactly what he did, right? I mean, it could have been the dis discussion prompt, and we're assuming it was, because that was the subject of the SJU Radicals' Instagram post. But it could have been anything, because they didn't provide any context as to what he was being charged for and the evidence to support that charge. And that was kind of that, right? He was, he was told... He would continue to get paid, but he couldn't teach, uh, at least through the current semester. He was also categorically forbidden to guest lecture in any other professor's class. And those punishments create two additional problems, one of which is that he is a PhD student. So he's not, you know, a tenured professor or anything, but he is a he, he does teach at the school. And in order to get your PhD, there is a teaching requirement. How do you fulfill that now? He asked about it. And last I heard, he wasn't told, given any 
uh, response. And then he also, he is, and this is another wrinkle to the story, a 9-11 survivor, uh, a first responder. I, I believe he was in the New York City Police Department for uh, something like a decade, which is another reason the SJU radicals didn't like him. Uh, and he was also a member of the United States military. And he typically guest lectures for other um, professors on campus on those topics. Is he now not allowed to go into those classrooms and guest lecture as part of his prohibition from stepping on campus? I, I don't know. Where, where do things currently stand with him, Adam? Well, that that is a good summary of the status quo. But he had to wait a week after the letter telling him he was responsible to find out any of that. The letter just told him he was responsible and that he'd have to meet with his dean to, to figure out more. And it was in that period between the letter finding him responsible, which I always thought was funny that the letter said he couldn't appeal it because it gave him no idea what the evidence was or what it was he was alleged to have done, which would make it impossible to appeal if there were an appeal mechanism. <laughs> I'm appealing this finding about this thing I don't know about based on this evidence I don't have. I mean, it's tough to make an appeal out of that. Maybe it was just a factual observation that he was unable to appeal. Uh, <laughs> right. It was just like, we're not telling you you can't, but good luck, yeah. right? Like, um, you know, one, one thing that folks should know is that there is absolutely nothing unusual in the idea that professors or students are being punished fairly severely uh, for things that they actually have no, they sincerely are not sure what they are supposed to have done. Um, that is a very common tactic that's used by universities. Um, and frankly, you know, it, it, it's it's appalling, although it's routine, but it's also something that we've seen, you know, particularly in the Title IX context, but in other, um, you know, context, universities pushing back against uh, FIRE's attempts to get them to introduce uh, some kind of uh, meaningful process uh, into things. But it's routine that they'll be, you, you know, even in... Um, you know, serious areas, uh, not that this isn't serious, but uh, like sexual misconduct, you might actually go to your trial having no clear idea of what exactly it is you're supposed to have done or even necessarily who's accusing you. Um, and universities have fought very hard to be able to continue to punish people uh, on that basis. And it really is a, um, a, a moral failing, I think, of the highest of the, of the highest order uh, to think that, you know, you should have so little accountability that you don't even need to tell somebody what they did um, as a university administrator who's uh, participating in what is allegedly some kind of fact finding process uh, to do this. And yet universities are, are absolutely uh, without shame. Uh, when it comes to demanding that they uh, continue to be allowed to do this. And it's appalling that they do. But, um, you know, I wish it were more unusual than it is. Well, they're also without shame in punishing professors as a result of outrage mobs mm -hmm. online, which is essentially what you got here. And we've seen this countless times across the country uh, and you know, during the past year, especially this summer, where there are groups mobilizing online. There is a professor who said something, maybe tweeted something, mm -hmm. or um, had a screen grab of their Zoom class in the post-COVID era, taken out of context, and they're investigated and in some cases punished. I mean, you recall earlier the, in the year, I believe it was in the University of California system, where a professor was explaining one of the most common filler words in the Chinese language and explaining uh, you know, what, what that word was. And it happened to sound like a racial slur. And this clip it was you know of a zoom class was cut up taken out of context of course and shared across the, uh, the country and across the world and the university subsequently investigated him for it ultimately i do not believe there was any punishment although i do think he lost he was removed from that class i don't recall if it was voluntarily or not uh and <laughs> coincidentally the the chinese students at that university rose to his defense saying no you know, what he was doing there was using a common Chinese filler word to uh, demonstrate a topic in a communications, a cross-cultural communications class. But the outrage mob does not care about that context, and the university, so eager to appease these mobs, is, is quick to jump in. Yeah, and you know, we have procedures and rules like you're supposed to know what you're being charged with doing in order to be able to counter uh, the effects of uh, you know, mob demands. Uh, here, you know, if you can't actually explain what somebody is supposed to have done, or in this case, he was actually being accused 
um, by this, you know, forum email that was sent to everybody of doing something that as, as far as we can tell, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's impossible to know what St. John's decided because they won't say, uh, but, you know, doesn't appear to be even at all what happened. Uh, that's why we have these procedures. And so every time you uh, decide one of them is unimportant or you're simply not going to do it, you make yourself less and less resistant uh, to the demands of a mob. That's, you know, frankly, I, it's not overstating it to think that's, that's kind of a brown shirt tactic, um, meaning that you have the authorities sort of conniving uh, whether or not it is uh, you know, actually coordinated, but you have the authorities relying on um, you know, mobs of people, whether they be in real life or, or um, you know, just virtually, uh, to do the work that the authorities want done but can't really do themselves. Um, and so it really is a very sinister uh, way of doing business that's unfortunately de rigueur on uh, college campuses right now. I was uh, visiting the Department of Justice, must have been last year sometime. And if you go into the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., you'll see a bunch of artwork on the walls. And the big mural that they have above their uh, somewhat famous library, I think it's on the second floor, is I forget the name of it, but it is a depiction of a man crawling up courthouse steps, being chased by a mob. Uh, one of the figures in the mob looks like uh, a skeleton, essentially. They're carrying pitchforks. They're carrying uh, lanterns. Uh, they're obviously out for blood for this guy. And standing on the courthouse steps is a judge holding up, you know, the book of law, or saying, you know, in this case, it could be the Constitution, with his hand outstretched at the mob, saying no and welcoming the man crawling up the courthouse steps to seek uh, refuge, you know, behind the laws, behind um, the justice system from an otherwise angry mob that wants to uh, expeditiously do away with whatever this. Uh, with this man and whatever he is uh, accused to have done. So I, that was a very moving mural to me when I first saw it and very indicative of the thing we're trying to oppose here, which is, you know, there is a process, there are rules for a reason, and we don't let whatever some sort of offended mob on the internet thinks decide who is guilty and who is not. Regardless of whatever you think of the Department of Justice, I know there's many people on here who will call it the Department of Injustice. Uh, I think that artwork stands on its own as a symbol, symbolic reason behind why we have due process of law in this country. Yeah, you know, it's not exactly a subtle message. Uh, what <laughs> no. But at the same time, it's pretty obvious that it's one that uh, you, you almost maybe, it could very easily be too subtle about because I think people have, um, it, it, I, I, look, it's not most people, but there is a noisy minority of people um, right now who have completely disregarded that kind of very basic reason that we have a justice system that regardless it's you know regardless of whether or not the mob is even right that's not the way we do justice in the united states um, and to the extent that we normalize uh, that kind of uh, quote unquote justice um, we are losing our our way as a country and, and frankly abandoning part of our our national character yeah another part of our national character at least since the 1950s of course is that we do not stand for segregation uh, racial segregation uh, in this country and Robert you recently wrote a letter to Portland Oregon's Lewis and Clark College about an orientation program that they had. Uh, that was helped put on by some group based out of Portland. Uh, engage, the program was called Engage in Racial Justice. But the program essentially, and, and it was mandatory as part of their orientation programming, uh, required you to identify as black, white, and I think indigenous slash person of color. And then as part of the programming, you were given separate educational experiences based on the color of your skin. Um, and this was all mandatory and obviously a form of racial segregation, which is unlawful in the United States. Robert, how did we hear about this case? And, uh, you know, obviously besides the obvious, why is it cause for concern? Yeah, well, uh, a professor at, uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, Lyle Asher, um, let us know, uh, that this was happening and, and I hate to say it, um, but it's not the first letter we've written uh, in FIRE's history about racially segregated uh, educational uh, experiences, although it has been a, a long time. Um, you know, it's no exaggeration, though, like you described, that it is literally, you know, asking, they, they, it was a little mandatory box. You had to fill out your skin color and you had three choices. 
that you described. And then uh, you were broken up into different Zoom rooms. I, I can only presume that when uh, there's not a pandemic going on, uh, this is done, you know, in literally separate rooms. And the idea is um, that, um, you know, looking at the most favorable light, the idea is, well, you know, people are more comfortable, I guess, talking about racial issues with people who are you know, nominally or, or identify with their own race. The, the problem with that um, is that uh, it is unlawful. Well, okay, that's actually not the problem <laughs> it, because there is the, the problem is that what you're doing there is you're actually delivering, like you said, a separate educational experience, a different one to people based solely on their ancestry, their genes, the color of their skin, not based on merit, not based on what they would prefer, um, you know, not based on what they want, but you're saying you're black, go through this door, you're white, go through this door. Um, and then we will do what we think is appropriate to do with black people and white people. Um, we, you know, in this country a long time ago, determined that uh, separate was not equal uh, functionally um, in this country, that there was just simply no way uh, to make separate equal. Um, this is not a, a controversial principle of law or one that the authorities at Lewis and Clark, uh, which is private, but is nevertheless, as you might imagine, uh, private schools also cannot uh, engage in racial segregation <laughs> if they take federal funds, almost all of them. Um, so uh, it, there's no way that the people at Lewis and Clark didn't know uh, they were engaging in segregation. In fact, we know that because Professor Asher actually emailed the president and the general counsel of Lewis and Clark and told them, you know, basically, are you serious? Can you look into this? And they did nothing. They let it happen anyway. Um, and so that's, you know, can you imagine going to, I mean, we have students now, these students at Lewis and Clark who um, in the very, you know, one of the very first few days of experiences at their new school as freshmen, uh, got split up by race mandatorily and uh, classified that way and then got to have different experiences. Just imagine, you know, in current year, as people like to say on the internet, going, you know, going to college and basically the first thing that happens to you is racial segregation. That's uh, <laughs> what, you know, it, I mean, talk about normalizing a bad idea. I mean, the, 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 the communication of values there is basically that, you know, things are so broken um, or that, you know, you just aren't capable of having these conversations with people who literally don't look like you. I, it's just, it's such a destructive, uh, thing when, when one puts even, you know, two seconds of thought together for it. And the fact that we had to write a letter, um, I mean, I felt like in some ways I had to jump in a time machine and go backwards. I'm actually, I mean, I had to, I had to do some research into the, you know, the cases that made segregation illegal because you don't cite those very much these days, uh, as you might <laughs> Uh, it's not something you run into all the time. Um, and then have them reply that they just don't think it's a big deal. I mean, that's what they came back and they're like, well, it was only one time and we probably won't do it again, although they didn't promise it. And, and actually their response basically implied that, well, it, it was, the tone was sort of like, well, since we know it upsets one of our professors, we probably won't do it again. That's not the reason you don't engage in racial segregation. Get out of here. Adam, did you want to say something? Yeah, when you look at the cases, oh, sorry, yeah, I was going to talk about we, we sort of went very quickly through, as, as, as we tend to, because everyone assumes it and understands it intrinsically to some degree, went through very quickly that segregation is illegal. <laughs> and I wanted to just add a little bit of extra detail as to why that is, because we, we all sort of know it goes back to that Brown versus Board of Education case. What sort of happened leading up to that was you had Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP bringing cases to challenge school segregation in four different places. They lost three and won one. And the strategy that eventually would cause them to win the fifth and final case, Brown versus Board of Ed, was to result, you know, resort to science and, and, and resort to research showing that segregation itself was damaging. It didn't matter whether the facilities were equal necessarily because the act of segregation was damaging. And that when you consider that the act itself is damaging and you make it an intrinsic element of your race training, You've sort of, you know, you're you're setting yourself up for failure if your goal is to reduce racial bias. Yeah, and you know, everybody knows about. I mean, I hope. I guess I'm probably overstating. Everybody knows about Brown versus Board of Education. Um, but one of the things I thought was interesting when I was doing the research because I felt like just citing Brown versus Board of Education and you know dropping the mic was not really the appropriate way to do it. Um, was you know finding the case that applied and actually, believe it or not, in higher education, it was a 1950 case. It was 
it was uh, four years before Brown versus Board of Education, if I'm doing the math right, um, it was uh, McLaurin versus Oklahoma. Um, and it was in that case a, I believe it was a black law student at the University of Oklahoma um, who was being segregated in really kind of very offensive. So meaningless but offensive ways for instance in the cafeteria he had to set at a different table like they didn't have two cafeterias uh for him because they hadn't had really black law students before that so they had him sit at a separate table in class he had to sit in like a separate row but he was in the same class and he could actually participate in class although i don't know how willing you would be to participate in class you just had sort of this you know no entry toxin zone um around you as a black person um, and Oklahoma was saying, well, you know, look, this is, uh, you know, he, he's getting his education. I mean, he's right there in class, you know, he's in the same facilities, that sort of thing. And thankfully the court, uh, did not buy that and pointed out that, no, that's a different educational experience in some ways though, you know, he was actually still able to engage, you know, if you're just a row away from your classmates, you can still ask the professor the same questions and hear it. Um, interestingly, in this, in this situation with the zoom segregation, that's literally impossible. Um, so in some ways you were more separated, uh, from people who had a different skin color, uh, than they were in 1950 in that, in that landmark case about higher ed Brown versus board of education is the one, uh, that got rid of it in all education. Um, and particularly in, in K through 12, where it was a huge issue, uh, but it actually hit higher ed first. So that was something that was news to me, it, you know, again, um, first amendment lawyer here and, and doing civil liberties, but it, it's not a part of the law you expect to have to apply a whole lot. So, uh, while maybe I'm, you know, uh, maybe everybody else already knew that it was, it was certainly a learning experience for me. Yeah. And Lewis and Clark still hasn't really given us the full throated rejection of these racial segregation programs no. that we hope they would. And you can go to fire's website and, use our take action portal to demand that they do uh, full throatedly reject racial segregation in the future. And, and I, I should say that you can do the same with that F aforementioned or afore discussed uh, St. John's case. We're still looking for a positive resolution to that case as well. Uh, can I add one more thing about St. John's? Yeah, as, as long course. as we bring it up again, as that um, Richard Taylor, the, the professor in question is being represented by Schlamstone and Dolan, a, uh, Boutique litigation firm. Oh, okay, so it's it's going to. So they're they're working on getting okay. a positive resolution. Very, <laughs> okay, very good. And and I should and I should also make the take this opportunity to plug Fire's legal network. So a lot of these cases run through our individual rights defense program, but the people we're helping could benefit from formal representation from an attorney. Um, uh, sometimes we take cases here in house uh, through our litigation department at Fire, but not always. Uh, not every case is well suited for that. Often there are employment law issues. Uh, that need to be dealt with that just, you know, isn't our forte. So if you're a lawyer out there listening to this podcast and you want to join the Fire Legal Network, you can just go to our website in the search bar, type in Fire Legal Network, and there will be a form where you can submit your information and become a part of that network. And then when we do have one of these cases and it's within your state, uh, we'll shoot you and we'll shoot every lawyer in the in that state an email, uh, giving them the opportunity to potentially review the case and uh take on that student or that faculty member or that student group as a client. So I'd urge you all to do that. Robert, before we close the book on Lewis and Clark, I want to ask you a little bit about thought reform. Uh, FIRE, since its founding, has been concerned about orientation programming uh, and other programming that seeks to reform students' thoughts. We, As part of our Guide to Student Rights on Campus, we have a book about thought reform programming. And while we're talking about racial segregation in the context of this Engage in Racial Justice program that Lewis and Clark put on, uh, since this summer, since the uh, you know racial justice protests that followed the George Floyd killing, uh, we've been seeing a rise or at least a rise in interest in anti-racism programming. Some of that programming has raised thought reform questions for FIRE. A lot of students in, uh, writing into us, faculty members as well, concerned about these programs. How should listeners think about these sorts of programs and when do they venture in to the thought reform territory? Right. Well, you know, thought reform has always been a, a harder nut to crack because, um, you know, broadly speaking, education, uh, you know, teaching someone to think critically is is kind of a form of that. But when we say thought reform at fire, uh, we mean basically using the coercive power of the authorities to um, 
tell people that they need to change their thoughts, you know, basically change their opinions to conform uh, with those that are uh, being promulgated by the authorities. Um, and that there is, uh, generally speaking, some kind of coercion or punishment um, involved in doing so. Um, so, you know, we're not, this is when, what, we, what you have to look for when you're considering these things is when the when the message and the effort goes uh, from trying to convince somebody that you're right to telling them that they have to say that you're right um, or that they have to believe uh, that you are right. And, and that does, um, you know, that, that level of coercion is what um, I think really takes it into the realm of what I think we could properly consider to be uh, you know, the sort of menacing uh, thought reform rather than education. It's There's no harm. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of benefit in learning about uh, different perspectives. Um, certainly in learning the law around um, discrimination is important to know. Uh, you don't want to fall afoul of the law. That's uh, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, and um, you know, and also learning, you know, various different beliefs about it, um, you know, recommended ways to behave around people can sometimes, although I think probably a lot less frequently than schools think, um, you know, can sometimes be helpful. Um, but when you see things like, well, you know, like Lewis and Clark, which is a good example where um, there is that element of coercion uh, based on your skin color or uh, what we what we're seeing a lot of now is uh, students and professors coming to us and saying they have a online often, uh, but sometimes in person orientation program where um, in order to advance, for instance, you know, like let's say they have a mandatory orientation thing, you've got to go through this online platform and they ask you questions. Uh, about things like what's the right thing to do in this situation? Somebody says, you know, a uh, racial slur to another person. What should you do? Um, when those are asking you, you know, what, what we'll see frequently is they'll say, you know, they'll give you three or four answers. You know, if one of them is like, you know, I don't say anything because it's none of my business. I don't want to get involved. You might say, you know, maybe you think that's the answer because you don't really want to get involved. Um, and as an American, you are not required to get involved in what two other people are talking about. That simply isn't something you, you're not compelled to do that. But then you'll click like, I don't want to get involved. And they'll say, sorry, try again. And basically, you can't advance through the thing until you give them the answer that they are seeking um, or that you acknowledge that they are right about it. And that can be a pretty fact intensive inquiry um, because they're allowed to ask you, what they think you should do, but they can't ask you what, you know, they can't make you say what you actually should do. That's, and so it, it can be a tough thing. And often people come to us with these things that, um, you know, frankly, I, I can easily see why people of all races, frankly, would be offended by some of the questions uh, that are being asked. They can seem insulting. They can seem reductive based on uh, race, sex, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make them thought reform. Um, what does is when there's that added element of coercion, you have to do this and you have to give us the right answers on this, or you cannot go on with your education. Um, and we are, I think, seeing more, I mean, we're definitely seeing an uptick in that, in this, um, the anti-racism education, um, as opposed to, I mean, it, there's always been an element of it in, in education about discrimination, but because I think the the ideology, and obviously people can argue about it, but the ideology of anti-racism, uh, part of that generally says that, you know, doing nothing is itself a form of racism. Uh, the sort of the inherent conflict in there is uh, if, you know, the thing they're requiring you to do is to think or say certain things, that's absolutely prohibited by the Constitution uh, for very good reason, for the same reason uh, that in West Virginia versus uh, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, uh, they determined that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, couldn't be made to salute the flag. Uh, there are some things you just you don't have to pledge allegiance um, to. The government cannot make you do that. Um, and yet here, I think we're seeing the government um, in the case of state universities and just more generally the authorities um, in the case of private universities, uh, do exactly that. And it, it is very worrisome. Well, just to provide clarity for our listeners, there are often, you know, almost all of our listeners will have taken a test at some point where there are right and wrong answers or where you have to fill out an essay um, prompt or respond to an essay prompt in which the answer can be variable and you have to provide supporting evidence. Those aren't the sort of things we're talking about here. We're talking about highly debated 
um, concepts in which the authorities are essentially telling you that there is only one right answer. Correct. That is, that is 100% correct. If the, you know, it's the difference, uh, you know, if, if they want to ask, you know, is the world round, um, or is it not, um, you know, one of those answers is wrong and the other one is right. If they're asking you sort of, you know, what should the world be like? Um, you know, what would be the best shape of the world? What, what, you know, or, you know, in a, more realistically, you know, what kind of system should we have? Um, you know, and if, if only communism or only capitalism were, were going to be the right answer, um, that would start to get more into the realm of thought reform. And uh, you're right. These are it really the rubber really hits the road, though, on these very controversial um, ideas such as, you know, all white people are all white people racist, for instance, is one that you'll see. Like, are you are you racist simply by having the skin color of a majority group and benefiting from the fact that you know people see you as that skin color does that make you a racist there are a lot of people who would argue yes uh there are a lot of people probably mo more people who would argue no um but you might see questions like that on some of these things and if you're made to say that yes that does make you racist and you don't believe that that's an example of coercive thought reform i want to turn now to texas where on september 30th the young conservative of texas chapter at the university of north texas placed a pro-life display, I think around a thousand flags on the campus lawn. And later that same day, about a third of the flags and several of the group's signs were stolen. Adam, you recently wrote about this for Fire's News Desk and talked about the response from the dean, I believe, of students at the University of North Texas. Her name is Maureen McGinnis. She had a meeting with the UNT or YCT UNT chairman Kelly uh, Neidert and the group's advisor, in which she said, she, you know, they couldn't really um, condemn this because that would be a form, this condemn this vandalism because that would be a form of heckler's veto, uh, which signals a misunderstanding on her part of what a heckler's veto is. Adam, can you talk a little bit about this case and, and the context and why it was so concerning to you that you thought you should write about it? Absolutely. I, I should say, having done this for a few years now, I know Robert would agree, you sort of see the same fact patterns pop up. And every so often you get a fact pattern that looks very familiar with one little twist or one thing about it that changes how you react or what you think about it. And I, I, I've seen many instances of flags being put on lawns for one memorial or another. I've seen them be trampled. I've seen them be stolen. But this is the first time I've ever heard of a school administrator talking deferentially about the heckler's veto, about talking about the, the school's fear that they should trample on the right of hecklers to censor people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which and Maureen first, McGinnis, yeah. in this case, I think we have a quote from her. This is what she said. She said, and she was saying this to the young conservatives chapter, because your event was free speech, somebody could come back and say, there's heckler's veto. So everybody that was doing things against you, because we didn't reserve that space, and even the taking of the flag, somebody can come back and say, that's I'm protected with a heckler's veto. What we're talking about is free speech. So she's essentially saying the destruction of this display was a form of free speech, and that we have to protect it. And, and it's a convoluted thing. We're trying to understand it. Stand here saying the heckler's veto is protected. I don't know, Adam, can you unpack it for me and for the listeners? Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting parallel to, to, to speech zones, which as fans of fire know, speech zones are unconstitutional because you can't comply with the First Amendment by showing the places you don't censor speech. You have to not censor speech in all the places. That's the obligation. Well, this interpretation of heckler's veto, what, what the heckler's veto actually says is that to the extent speakers are trying to, or uh, hecklers are trying to silence speakers, the government has an obligation to prevent the hecklers from succeeding. So this idea that, well, if you had reserved the space, you would be entitled to the heckler's veto as it should exist. But because you didn't reserve the space, the heckler's veto means they have the right to interfere with your speech. It, it almost reimposes speech codes in this strange, like, paperwork and, regulatory and, and, way. And, and Adam, can I just provide a, clear, uh, a clarifying point on your heckler's veto definition? When you say the government um, cannot, has to protect the speech, it means it can't shut down that group that's seeking to speak because there are hecklers out there that are seeking to shut it down, correct? Absolutely. So, like, the government can't shut down 
a speaker because there are angry mobs outside the venue, uh, unless there's just no conceivable way that the government provo- can provide protection for those speakers. You know, it needs to it needs to do everything within its power to protect them. Correct. Exactly. If there's no other way to stop loss of life or limb, then at that point, yes, they could take steps to delay the speech in question. But they have to do everything short of that. And that means whether that's providing security without charging the speaker for it, because that would be that's heckler's veto by, by the purse. It's not any better. Whatever they ha- whatever the state has to do to ensure the speech can continue safely is what the state has to do. This is why you'll see, um, you know, maybe sort of something that people actually see this was i think used to be more common but you'd see often in cities you know a bu- somebody would bus in you know like 12 clan members from out of town and they would decide to march through uh downtown or through a historically black uh part of the city and you'd see the policemen sort of surrounding the clan and making sure that they were able to do that that is to prevent uh the hecklers from having a veto over speech i think part of what i think may have been confusing this person here is that the heckler's veto is not an action like it's not something we're trying to establish what they what the what the courts say is that we cannot allow hecklers to have a veto over the speech and when that is allowed that's a heckler's veto so i i think she she may have been thinking that like hecklers had an established right to veto things but it's actually the the opposite of that yeah, and I we should also clarify for li- our listeners there is the legal concept that we had just discussed, but there's also this more amorphous cultural concept whereby when groups try to heckler speaker and shut it shut down speakers, uh, that's often called a heckler's veto too. In the same way that you know with the Muhammad cartoons or with the Charlie Hebdo massacre, uh, we'll call those the assassin's veto, for example. It's not a formal legal topic or a legal concept, but it's kind of culturally what we call these sorts of shutting down of speech by hecklers or by assassins in the latter case. So it's it it's often gets confused in this discussion, whether you're talking about the cultural concept or the formal legal concept, which places a duty upon the government to prevent these sort of hecklers vetoes. So Adam, what ended up happening in this case? So the, you know, there wasn't a full-throated defense of of the student group's right to have this sort of campus event. I, I believe that one of, was it, is it correct to say that one of the students who stole the flags was charged with theft? Were they able to, to find one of the students? They, they were charged with something, yeah. That, and, and they recovered the about 140 or 150 flags that student had. There's still another 150 or 160 flags floating out there somewhere uh, that are unknown. Yeah, but these uh, these events are, I mean, this this sort of happens almost every year or every other year where the pro-life student groups are putting up flags or other sorts of display to represent this, the lives lost to abortion. And uh, they're just uh, trampled over or stolen. I think there was one case we had, Robert, you might recall about a decade ago where a professor was one of the people doing the destruction of the event. Yeah, we had one and we had one where uh, my quote unquote favorite was probably where somebody decided to run over them with yep. their car. Um, you know, they had the motorist. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, they, the, the flag displays generally, yeah, it's one flag for every, you know, thousand abortions or whatever is, is how it's done. Um, and the, yeah, I mean, that they are, a, it's a very common target uh, for vandalism or uh, for a you know, hecklers to try to establish a veto over that kind of speech. I want to turn now, unless Adam, you had anything else you wanted to add. Well, that's one last thing there, um, that what this, what the young conservatives were asking from the Dean of Students was for the school to make a statement condemning the destruction of the display. And that's, that has still not happened. The, the school has still not made a, made a statement saying, please don't go around destroying, destroying people's political displays. <laughs> Because you wouldn't want to chill yeah, the University speech. of North Texas is, is kind of on our list of bad actors and might actually be on our list of 10 worst colleges for free speech after earlier this year uh, launching an investigation into a music professor who had published an article about a, I, I don't know, what was it, a composer, Robert? I don't know if you'll recall, but there was like pushing back on accusations that this composer was racist and apparently pushing back on those accusations that this I, it, actually, it wasn't even that. It was pushing back on the idea that all of, I believe it was pushing back on the idea that music theory itself was racist. This guy, 
itself was racist because this um, Schenk, this guy Schenkner, who was an Austrian or something like that from back in the, the early 1900s, um, was alleged to have racist views or, or sympathy with uh, fascism. And, you know, there was a debate over whether that meant, because I guess Schenknerian music theory is a big deal. I have zero, I mean, I'm sure lots of people know more about this than I do, but, uh, you know, the idea is, are, are, you know, was music theory itself um, a form of white supremacy or, or racist? And his pushing back on the idea that because, um, you know, Schenkner was involved at the founding of this, um, you know, was, uh, you know, he pushed back on the idea that that meant everything was racist. Um, he was, you know, really targeted by a lot of, I believe it was mostly grad students in the department um, for, you know, basically just sharing his academic opinion in a journal he edited called the Journal of Schenknerian Studies. I mean, we're talking... Very, <laughs> and it very- was in response to another another a scholar making this argument. So is it, that's sort of dialectic yeah. that you would hope would happen in an academic community. Yeah, it has to happen, and it, it wasn't being allowed to. And yeah, UNT did not cover itself in glory there. No. I want to turn now to our the final case we're going to discuss. Uh, you know, the previous one was about a pro life display. This next one at the University of Northern Iowa is about a pro life group. On October seventh, the Northern Iowa student government considered a bill to recognize a University of Northern Iowa chapter of Students for Life. This is a nationwide student organization with chapters on many different campuses, which is a pro life student group, obviously. This bill failed, 3 to 11, after an hour-long debate during which senators raised a uh, litany of concerns, including that the organization was, quote, hateful, quote, infringed on human rights, and would that recognizing the group would open the door to, quote, outside agitation on campus because of its affiliation with the National Organization of Students for Life. There are some more doozies from the student senators here. Uh, one senator said, this is a hate group. This is a hate. This is hate speech. This is hateful rhetoric that is infringing on the human rights of healthcare. Uh, another claim: This isn't about opinions. It's not about speech. It's not about censorship. It's about a specific group of people that are part of a national organization whose specific intended goal is to pursue actions that will be harmful to our community. And uh, yeah, so they they did they failed the student government uh, to recognize this student group uh, in violation of what we would, would argue are their First Amendment duties as an agent of the state. Robert, this isn't the first time we have seen a student government, as you said earlier, cover itself in glory, right? Uh, you know, what are the duties of student governments when when looking at student groups uh, becoming a recognized student organization on any particular campus? Yeah, so for when Student, org- student governments traditionally um, have the power to recognize and, and often to fund, or at least to, by recognizing them, make them eligible for receiving funds uh, for different student groups. Um, when they are doing that, um, they are an agent of the university. Uh, they're basically the people the university has put in charge of doing this, and therefore they have the same responsibilities the university would. When they're at a private, or excuse me, a public university like the University of Northern Iowa, that means they are an agency of an agency of the government, which means effectively they're acting in the place of the government. And so the government has certain obligations, uh, you know, in terms of First Amendment rights, uh, one of the foremost and most obvious of which is not to engage in viewpoint-based discrimination. Um, and obviously not to engage in, you know, censorship. Um, and so what, what we've seen your, um, student governments do over and over again is they, um, instead of taking that responsibility seriously, um, or, or sometimes even having any awareness of that responsibility, they do uh, use the viewpoints of the groups and their own opinions in order to determine, you know, I should say their own opinion on what that group believes. Um, in order to determine whether or not they vote to recognize a student group. Now, they are supposed to be using their judgment um, for these things, but it's not supposed to be judgment based on viewpoint. For instance, let's say somebody turns in a constitution that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't uh, comply with a student uh, group requirements. Maybe they don't have it. Yeah. A student group constitution, yes, I should say. Um, or, you know, they're, you know, let's say they, they apply for funding for, you know, we all want to go to New Orleans and get trashed uh, event. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, you, you would expect the student government to exercise its, uh, you know, its, its judgment on. And, and that's where I, and examples of where they could say no. But um, 
you know, simply saying the word hate over and over again, or claiming that it's not about opinions, it's not about speech, when it in fact is about opinions and speech, as it was here, um, does not uh, relieve you of that responsibility. Students for Life, like you said, is a national organization. Um, it has chapters on many, many campuses. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that they're affiliated with it or the fact that they are going to, um, you know, oppose abortion, which is, you know, very, you know, that's obviously pro-life and pro-choice activism or, you know, core parts of political speech in the United States uh, is not a legitimate reason to turn down a, um, a student group um, for recognition, even though uh, that seems to be exactly what you and I did there and left plenty of evidence uh, explaining that why they did it. <laughs> And one of the student senators even knew that not recognizing the group based on viewpoint, based on the fact that they just didn't like the viewpoint of this group, uh, would open them up to a sort of legal liability. The senator opined that not the not recognize that recognizing the group because they were concerned about legal liability was quote extremely facile and weak. Uh, it was an extremely facile and weak defense that quote privileged money and admins over student well being. Now, this was appealed to the Northern Iowa Student Government Supreme Court, where they once again denied this group uh, the right to become an officially recognized chapter, apparently on the grounds that the organization was not formed in, quote, good faith for a lawful purpose, whatever that means. But, you know, we wrote to the University of Northern Iowa's president, Mark Nook, who overturned, thankfully, the student government decision and granted formal recognition to Students for Life. In his decision, he noted, universities exist to give students and all members of the community an opportunity to wrestle with a vast diversity of ideas and opinions, to challenge their perception of their own identity and the beliefs and opinions of others, and to grow in their understanding of natural and social systems. So, you know, a good outcome to that case where we haven't had <laughs> a good outcome to the previous three cases that we discussed. So it's probably a good place to end unless Robert or Adam, you had anything else you wanted to add on this case in particular. Yeah. Over, you know, asking, um, you know, uh, a student government decision to be overturned is not something that FIRE does lightly. Um, we want student governments um, to have autonomy and authority. We don't want them to just simply be the puppet um, of the university. Otherwise, I mean, if they're going to do that, then why have a student government at all? Um, however, they do have these legal responsibilities. Um, and, you know, we so FIRE, you know, we, we try to reach out often to student governments. If, if we hear about it soon enough, we'll say, hey, you know, we'll write a letter to the student government folks themselves, explaining the law to them, asking them to do the right thing. Uh, sometimes that works. Um, I'd say probably more often it doesn't. Um, however, we have had a lot of success in, you know, when there is a obvious case of viewpoint discrimination here, we've actually had a great deal of success in getting, um, university administrations to overturn the decisions of the student government and go ahead and recognize, uh, the groups anyway. It is a very obviously and, and well-established principle that they have to do that. Um, it is unfortunate. Um, I, I think they could, you know, certainly they could and should be doing more to, uh, educate student government. Uh, officials on, you know, their responsibilities. I mean, th these are, you know, uh, look, I understand, you know, student government is, you know, not always a real overly serious thing, but, you know, in, in this, in this particular matter, you are really wielding the, the power of the state. And I think uh, student government officials could really uh, be a lot more educated and take a lot more seriously the fact that, you know, I mean, the, the, the sovereign state of Iowa has given you a share of its power and you have to use that responsibility, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, um, you know, and, uh, and to do that. So I'm, I'm glad that Northern Iowa did that. I hope this will stand for some kind of education there. Um, I wish it were less common uh, than it is. And I think schools could be doing a lot more to educate student governments um, on this stuff, particularly when it is actual, you know, their actual legal obligations. Well, Robert and Adam, I think we will leave it there. Um, thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you. Happy to do it. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We take feedback at so to speak 
at thefire.org. If you enjoyed this episode, it'd be good for you and better for us if you consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. They help us attract new listeners to the show and consequently new listeners to the concepts of free speech and open dialogue. Until next time, I thank you all again for listening. 